there are lots of things in the world that we could do. We could spend our time in, you know, worrying. We could spend our time in righteousness sake, you know, going out and trying to change the world and to develop it into a better place to somehow, you know, start a initiative or a movement to save the planet, you know. Now, never mind that we know that the end of the world is at hand, that Jesus is coming soon, and that it will not matter, really, in the long term, what we do in the short term if we think we're going to take 20 years to accomplish it. Because though God said to occupy till he comes, an occupation is not an occupying force. It is a force for good that we are in the world, but not of the world. So when the world gets carried away or caught up into certain tendencies that it's always going to do that imitate what God is eventually going to accomplish, don't get caught up in the world and its ways. Rather, choose today to get caught up with the things that matter, the things that are for righteousness sake. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things would be added unto you. For God himself is going to do a makeover when it comes to the world. He is going to change the appearance of what we see today. The highest of mountains will be brought low. The lowest of valleys will be raised up. There will be an even plane, we're told, that when God comes, he shall establish his kingdom for a thousand years. Now until that time, really a lot of what people are doing are wasting their time. Because it isn't going to accomplish what they think. It's going to distract them from the things that are really more important. For after all, would you rather invest your time to not see it accomplished? Because Jesus said it this way. No man that goes to war doesn't first sit down and consider carefully what he has as far as resources are and how many men he's got and how to supply them and how to take care of them and how many men the enemy has and how many resources he has and how to supply them and when he considers those things he looks and sees whether or not he would be able to win or accomplish the battle because after all if he's going against an opposing force that's greater than he is he's not going to plan on going against him right away he's going to build up his forces so that He's assured of victory. So too, likewise, we are told to sit down and consider our ways, to be sober-minded in these latter days, to consider well the time that we invest and the energy that we use in certain things that may be attractions that are really distractions from the main attraction that's coming, which is the soon return of Jesus. Jesus said, watch and be ready, for you know not the hour or the day with which the Son of Man returned. And it isn't that you can't know. It isn't that you won't know. It isn't as though Jesus hasn't been told since he went back to the Father. But that the Father has reserved unto himself the time that he sends his Son. Because Jesus will be sent by the Father. Now, when you spend time with the Father, you know that his timing is perfect. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, <coughs> and so <coughs> if he take that time, to work on someone for salvation, then we say, praise the Lord. But we know that God has not delayed anything when it comes to salvation. But he is willing to say to the uttermost, even those that call upon the name of the Lord. <coughs> As such, what manner of man or woman ought we to be? <coughs> Should we not consider our ways and consider the days and the times that we live in? When Jeremiah told the children of Israel, look, you can go to war if you want to, you'll lose. You can mourn and wail if you want to, you'll lose. Or you could accept God's will and be taken into captivity. <coughs> For this is the will of God. <coughs> wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is the will of God in choking. <laughs> well, I can feel that in my throat. Something. Was there something in the coffee? 
But this is the will of God in Christ Jesus in that they were going to go into captivity because they were reaping what they had sown. It was accomplished that with which they had chosen and then God caused them to go into captivity because they had not done the things that he said. A lot of times people tell me about the political process and that how I need to be so involved in it because they uh, don't accept the fact that perhaps the person they have in office is someone they chose and now they reap what they've sown because after all, if we pray, Jesus said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. It doesn't say he'll change the administration or do something different, but it says that he can change the king's heart and turn it whatsoever will he chooses. So we don't have to operate according to the world and its ways by being political activists or social reformers or to worry about what people seem to be worried about nowadays, which is like, oh my God. You know, the Russians are coming. Oh, wait a minute. That was back in the Cold War. Now we have the religious war. Oh, my God. The Muslims are coming. Sharia law is coming. I think people have gotten a little distracted again by the attraction of distraction. You see, there is this idea that if you get hyped, and that's what shock jocks do when they're on the radio, they hype you up. They work you up. They get your emotions going so quick and so fast you don't have to think, oh, who's coming? The sky is falling, the sky is falling. Oh no, run, hide, cover. And a lot of people operate their lives that way. They are conspiracy people. They are people who don't know how to process information. They are like Chicken Little running around when the rain falls thinking that the sky is falling because they don't know what it is. A lot of people on the internet will post a lot of information not knowing what it is. I myself have told people, look, you just posted a cult that here's what they're saying, here's what they believe in, and now here's the picture that they presented and you posted it. Do you realize you've done that? And I go, oh, you're right. Now that you told me, my eyes are open and I see. Wow, I didn't know. And a lot of times that's the sad part. People don't take the time to pay attention to what they're doing. And that's what the warning is in these latter days, to pay attention because everyone wants to make an attraction out of anything that happens in the world. They want to make it interesting to you, so they will blow it out of proportion. They will cause the news to look sensational. I remember, matter of fact, standing in Jerusalem itself at the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, the Prayer Wall. And I remember seeing this group of conservative, uh, actually they were Reformed Jews, Reformed Jews come up to pray and some Orthodox Jews bar their way. You know, they stood in the way. I was standing there at the time. I saw it with my own eyes. And they said, no, you can't go forward because the Reform were not accepted technically, you know, as, you know, inside of Judaism, whether you know it or not, people are always arguing about, who's a Jew? You a Jew? No, you're not a Jew. I'm sorry, you're not a Jew. It doesn't matter whether your mother or your father or whoever, we don't care because you don't believe like we do, so you're not a Jew. Oh. But besides that, in Jerusalem at the time when I was standing at the Wailing Wall, they were trying to come forward, and so there was a minor scuffle where, you know, Orthodox Jews will spit, you know, and sometimes, you know, stand in the way and, you know, bar the way and do things that aren't necessarily acceptable, and then the Israeli army comes in like police force and just moves people out of the way. Well, no Israeli army showed up. The situation, you know, with the city police was taken care of. They came over, you know, and calmly talked to the Orthodox, calmly talked to Reform, Reform left, you know, and Orthodox went back to what they're doing. The next day in America, the riot was reported in Jerusalem. And I went, really? Wow, what riot? Reform riots at the Wailing Wall. And I looked and I went, Oh wow, I was there because I was working in the ministry at the time and I was writing newsletters sending them back from Jerusalem. And so it was interesting that I saw how the news reports were blowing out of proportion something that didn't happen at all in Jerusalem. And it was picked up by almost all Christian services and it was picked up by some of the news services and I went, huh. 
So that's how it works. You know, and so I, I began to investigate a lot of some of the news services that were reporting from Jerusalem live, you know, and as I worked in all the different ministries and got the chance to meet some of the people that were there in Israel while I lived there, because I was living there for 14 months, that I was shocked to see how bad people wanted information from Israel and were willing to accept anything that was said as long as it had from Israel on it. Unfortunately, today, we're the same way. Whatever we do, we get excited about because people will tell us that it's true. Oh, it's true. Really, it is. Honestly, gold dust thrown in the air. Oh, that, that's got to be true. It's got to be God because, after all, the person says, it's direct from heaven. Or a person says, hey, I went down to hell and I went down to heaven and I came back to tell you what it's all about. It only cost you three ninety five to get in and hear about it or buy my book or buy my tape. People are excited. They get excited about some of the craziest things that even Christians do. You know, like rolling around on the floor, or parking like dogs, you know, doing things that you never heard of in Scripture, but they tell us that it's there. In these latter days, there's going to be more information than you can ever imagine thrown at you. You know, things like the president is a Muslim. No, he's not. Come on, 17 years in a Christian church, it's impossible for him to be a Muslim. He wouldn't have been a Muslim and been in a Christian church. Now, you may not like the type of Christian church he was in, just like you may not like, you know, Catholic churches if you're non-Catholic, because there's this animosity between uh, Catholics and Protestants that has gone on for centuries. You know, it's like, well, could some Christians be in the Catholic Church? Of course they are. The Catholic Church is the largest Christian denomination. But you talk to an evangelical and they'll tell you that, no, they're not Christian. Well, what they mean is some people in the Catholic Church may not be Christian. doesn't mean the entire church is non-Christian. I mean, come on. I was in the Jesus movement and I went to charismatic meetings that there were some Christians in there that are more Christian than the Christians. Oh, boy, were they awesome. Were they caught up into the Mary Knoll and Mary this and, you know, Pope this and Pope of that and pontificates and, you know, the, the, uh, I wanted to say paternity, but it's not paternity, but the patria, you know, the father thing aspect of the church? No, they weren't. As a matter of fact, they said that God told them to stay in the church, you know, and one of them was a priest, you know, and I was amazed that there was that kind of understanding of scripture that there could be such a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit inside of the Catholic Church that some were saved. I'm not going to say all of them. The same thing is true about sometimes in denominations. We can't write off an entire denomination and say, oh, well, they're all wrong. Unless, like some, they are all wrong, you know, like the Mormon Church. Well, of course it's not a denomination and it's not a Christian. It's never been part of the Christian religion. It's always been a false religion. Uh, cult as it were because it followed a false prophet into a false denomination or false religion and now they've broken up into different pieces where even inside their own religious observances they don't do everything the same there may be one or two Christians in there but I don't think there's too many you know <laughs> but we'll pray for them because they need to come out of you know a cult so that they can discover who Jesus is instead of saying he's a son of Satan or a brother of Satan so a lot of information gets sensationalized and blown out of proportion because people get wound up and excitable. How do we manage our lives in order to not get wound up, to not get excited, to not get provoked into doing something, oh my God, I need to hurry up and sign up on the internet for the latest, you know, sign this petition routine. What is spam in the Christian world today? What is being spammed at you? What is being shock-jocked at you? What is this new way of looking at tabloid Christianity as though it were the Word of God when we have the Bible right in front of us? What we are told to do is to be still and know that I'm God. Think about that for a minute.
Was that hard for you to do? Did you try to adjust your video monitor? Did you get impatient and go get a cup of coffee? Did you hurry off to see if something else was going on the TV? Could you not be still for one minute? The Tyranny of the Urgent was an old article that was written probably about 50s, 60s, 70s, I think, if I remember right. And it talked about how the hype and the wiring up of the American Christian is getting to such a high fervor that people will draw improper conclusions because they don't have time to think. They don't stop, look, listen, and evaluate. They think they can make snap decisions based upon what they presume is the proper information they've been given when they don't evaluate resources. Now, in modern times, we have seen quite a few news services actually have to print retractions to state that they were wrong because they didn't really check the resources. They didn't go out of their way because they had a deadline to make. They had to get their sound bite in. They had to go through their little spin cycle you know, in order to come through with the wash and see if their story washed out in the long run. And a lot of times, it came out of the washing machine dirty. Because, unfortunately, the tyranny of the urgent is worse now than it's ever been. And that is the deception that's in the world. It makes you think you have to hurry up when God could cause the sun right now to stand still and we could sit here for 24 hours watching the sun not move. Couldn't he do it? Do you doubt that? He did it for Joshua. He even caused the sun to go backwards some. He did it for Moses. There are things that we know that God has done that he could do and may have done today and you didn't know it. Your vision of time is distorted by your perspective based upon where you're at in the world. You may think that 24 hours never changes, but in reality, God could shift that time frame just like Einstein proved it could happen, and that time would not be the same for you as it is for me. God could literally slow time down, and I could be here existing and enjoying the fellowship with the Father for an hour, and yet only a minute seemed like it went by. How so? Some people would say, well, you were transported out of this dimension into the alternative dimensional reality of the eternal now which exists within the spiritual plane because no longer are you subject to the physical laws that time is a dimension of the fifth dimension or the sixth dimension and that time and space is no longer applicable to you because you were taken out of that place and you were put back into your same place and you picked back up right where you left off. Oh, so theoretical quantum physics has already decided within mathematical equations how that could be a reality, though God has already said so. Interesting, isn't it, that science is proving scriptures are true. So a lot of times when you think you're in a hurry, let me give you a word. Don't be in a hurry. Chuck Gerard sang a song, Don't You Be In Such a Hurry, Because It Only Leads to Worry. There's a time to work and there's a time to pray. Try to find a quiet place to hear his voice and seek his face. Can you hear the Spirit calling? Come away. And I think it's Tommy Coombs in Maranatha, now that I think about it. It wasn't Chuck Gerard, it was Tommy, Tommy Coombs. And I think it was in uh, Praise 7 of Maranatha Music. But the point being is that God desires you to stop. First aid now teaches a different way of being a first responder. They don't tell you to dive in immediately and just try to save someone's life. They say, stop, evaluate the situation. Do you need to like, you know, maybe instead of trying to apply first aid, do you need to pull the person out of the burning car that's about to blow up? In other words, look around evaluate your environment of what's going on before you dive in and do the things. Because people were getting too carried away. You know, if you see a man drowning, you know, and you dive in, that's stupid. Especially if you just saw four sharks that are spitting around him. I think you'd get a gun first and shoot the sharks before you dove in. You see how sometimes 
circumstances of situations may not be what they appear to be. The same thing is true spiritually. When you think you need to do something, listen to the Spirit of God that may be checking you and saying, Stop! Let's talk this over for a minute. Because we're told in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that we could trust in the Lord with all our heart. Meaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him so He could direct our path. That means we need to back up and take a second look. Sometimes we need to take a third look. Sometimes we need to take a fourth look. Because after all, we've gotten so used to snap decisions, God doesn't operate that way. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways different than your ways, or my thoughts from your thoughts. Likewise, when God said a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, I think we're going to find that rather than hurrying up and running like we think running a race is, God wanted to walk with us, to talk with us, to have us sit still, to be still, to hear his voice, and then when he says go, we go. We don't jump up and run off. We walk with him so that we are walking in his spirit and with the spirit of God as opposed to running ahead of God and finding out that we're behind the times that we should be living in because we haven't been sober-minded in what we should be doing, which is to hear what God has to say to us. We look for the Savior. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Most of the music I hear lately is more adrenaline-based to cause us to inspire rather than wait and conspire in our hearts to be still. The peace of God has been made manifest to us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He never was in a hurry. He never rushed. He didn't run anywhere. He didn't ask the Father to hurry up. He anticipated looking forward to the cross and to that day that he would cause the sins of the world to be removed so that we could have access to his Father. But other than that, Jesus didn't rush. He didn't run. He didn't move in a quick and anxious pace. As a matter of fact, we're told to be anxious for nothing, but in everything give thanks. When his disciples were rushed and in a hurry, he said, hey, don't worry. I got this storm covered. When they were like wondering, you know, what are you going to do? He was calm. We're told to weigh on the Lord. We're singing songs at times of waiting on the Lord. At times, I wonder if waiting on the Lord is really God waiting for us to slow down and stop so that we would walk in perfect timing with His will as opposed to running ahead of what He's doing and saying. Because, you see, you could have the right words, you could have the right actions, you could have the right attitude. But if your timing's off, I don't know, I don't think that's exactly what God intends for us. I think He wants everything to work 
cooperatively, perfectly in his will, in his time, and in his way. Today, if you hear his voice, wait on the Lord. Let him speak and let him make the choice for you. Wait, I say, on the Lord, and he will confirm his word to you. Wait, I say, on the Lord, and he will reveal his salvation to you. Wait, I say, on the Lord, and let his spirit move for you so you don't need to do anything but wait. 